Hi, I'm Spiro Skensos, and welcome to Comic-Con at Home 2020. <laughs> I'm your moderator for this intro to TV writing panel. I hope you found a good seat. You see there are still some seats in the back. You might want to make some room for people. This is the 11th year I've been doing this panel, and this was almost the year without a Comic-Con. When the con reached out about doing a virtual panel at first, I wasn't so sure with our COVID apocalypse and the continued inequality and unrest, like, was it really appropriate? But I thought about it and I remembered that as writers, as artists, it's our duty to take what we're witnessing and feeling and, and write about it, to turn it into art, to quell the fire inside of us, to educate and entertain others to, and to uplift our voices. So because as writers, we all have something to say and this panel will help us do just that. At least I hope it will get you started anyway. So uh, let me introduce these awesomely talented people who are going to talk to us about how to put your best script forward. Nicole Levy escaped her childhood in the desert for the bright lights of Los Angeles, originally to study acting, but then realized her true love was writing stories, not playing them out. She worked as a police dispatcher to pay her way through USC undergrad, wow. and then got her master's at, under, at USC as well. An alum of both the CBS and NBC writing programs, Nicole has written on Ironside, Allegiance, The Mysteries of Laura, Shades of Blue, Cloak and Dagger, and Fate. She also co-wrote a feature, The Banker, available on Apple TV+. Nicole is currently a supervising producer on SWAT, which airs on CBS. Jamie Paglia is a film and television writer, producer, director, and the co-creator of the record-setting TV series, Eureka, the longest running series, original series in Sci-Fi Channel's history. He was the executive producer, co-showrunner of Scream on MTV. He also served as a co-executive producer on The Flash. Most recently, he was consulting producer for the groundbreaking Netflix Asia series, Nowhere Man, as well as HBO's Asia, HBO Asia's award-winning drama, Teen, Teenage Psychic and Dead Island. He has written original pilots and feature films for many studios and networks, including Netflix, ABC Disney, TNT, New Line, among others. He's currently collaborating with Whoopi Goldberg in a new project for Dark Horse. Letitia Baylor is manager of scripted content for USA, Sci-Fi, and NBC Universal's streaming service, Peacock. She has shepherded groundbreaking, diverse genre series, including Sci-Fi's The Expanse, which I love, The Magicians, Killjoys, 12 Monkeys, and Channel Zero. Currently, she manages USA's Dirty John, Sci-Fi's Chucky, and the Battlestar Galactica reboot for Peacock. She started her career in 2004 as an assistant at Sci-Fi, Originally from Baltimore, she's been a sci-fi nerd before she can even remember and currently resides in LA with her pit bull mix, Phoebe. Last but not least is Bob Goodman. Is He's a television writer producer currently serving as co-EP on the Fox series 911. Previously, Bob was an executive producer, <clears throat> excuse me, on Elementary at CBS. <clears throat> and before that wrote and produced Sci-Fi's Warehouse 13. He sold pilots to ABC, CBS, and recently adapted a YA novel for Sam Raimi. Prior to live action, Bob wrote for many years in animation, primarily at Warner Brothers. His credits include Batman, Justice League Unlimited, and Ben 10. He also created and ran the Batman Beyond spinoff, The Zeta Project. He's also written the direct to DVD animated features, including the two-part Batman The Dark Knight Returns. Yes. Bob has received two Daytime Emmy Awards, as well as an Annie Award nomination for individual achievement in writing. I hope you're all giving them a round of applause from wherever you are. And now well, let's later. get into it. Um, welcome you guys, and thanks for spending an hour of your Saturday afternoon with me. Um, and let's just jump in. So there are two types of spec scripts people usually write. You can write a, a spec of an existing show or an original pilot. Writing programs usually want a spec of a show, but we'll get into both of these, but let's talk specking a show first. Why is it important to spec a show when starting out? Who should do this? And Nicole, would you like to start the conversation on this? Sure, uh, I'm happy to jump in because it is a thing I proselytize about quite a bit. Um, the answer to who should be writing uh, spec episodes of existing shows is every single person who wants to write television is their career. And the reason behind that is it is literally the job you want. You want to walk into a writer's room and have to write an episode of the show with the characters in the world following the rules and come up with an interesting story. 
And if you can do that on your own, you can certainly do it with a writer's room's full support. So it's about learning the, the basics of it's, TV writing. <clears throat> it's about building your craft. And the more you do it, the better you get at it, the, the quicker you see solutions to story problems. Um, and I think part of the resistance of why people don't want to do it is the now that showrunners don't typically read specs as samples for new writers. And I totally get that. I get that they need to invest more time in writing pilots because that's typically what will get you the job. But if you haven't put in the hours writing the specs, your first script will be very difficult. And I say this as someone who wrote 12 specs before she got her first job. And still, my first episode of a real television show was hard, hard work. And thankfully, yeah, I had the building blocks to, to get over the hump. Yeah, that's great. Um, does anyone else want to chime in on that? Yeah, uh, first of all, I, mean, I agree 100% with everything, everything Nicole said, but I'll, I'll add a few other sort of facets to it. Um, one of the other skills you need, you know, when you break through and find yourself uh, on an actual show is emulating that show's voice, emulating the showrunner's voice. And like that is what you're going to get practice doing, studying a show, studying how to write a spec of it. Uh, if you were to only spend your time, you know, uh, exercising the muscles to write a pilot, you would never learn that skill, which is kind of job one. Um, my, I always um, argue that people should be, when, when, you, when you write a spec, get your hands on copies of the show if you can. The Writers Guild has an incredible library of, of scripts of existing shows. Nowadays, you can find almost any show's pilot, the script online, and make it your job to get into the heads of the people who wrote this thing, all the way down to punctuation, all the way down to that, you know, that never ending argument of one space or two after the period. The correct answer, in my opinion, to one space or two after the period is whatever the showrunner says it is. <laughs> it's um, exactly correct. right. Correct. Yeah, it's so true. Um, it's, it's that level of, um, sounds like a dirty word, but mimicry that you're gonna need to master uh, if you want to work your way up the ranks in TV. The, the one other thing, I don't wanna hog the, the mic, um, Nicole mentioned that showrunners uh, nowadays want to read pilots more than specs. Um, that, I think that's statistically true, um, but I certainly know that plenty of showrunners are happy to read specs. I'm one of them. Um, uh, and I think you're going to see that increase. Um, uh, Spiro, you've heard me get on the soapbox about this before, that yeah. I think that a lot, of the push, a lot of the push in recent years um, in the industry to get writers to only write pilots and not specs, I think came... Prime, came, came originally, I mean, we all kind of picked it up, but, it, but it, a lot of the push was from the representatives. A lot of the push was from managers and agents who are looking, who were looking for that packaging fee, or in the case of managers, looking to attach themselves as producers. Basically, they, they look at the writers as though they're panning for gold, as though like, you know, and, and, and this can be very well intentioned. It can be, um, you know, I'm trying to help this person have a career and the fastest way to have a career is sell that pilot, um, but the so 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 what they're doing is they're they're looking for that you know that gem. They're like I said, they're they're panning for gold. The problem with panning for gold is if you extend the metaphor, everyone who didn't write a pilot they can sell today is all the rest of the dirt in that pan, and the agents and reps don't do their jobs for you. Uh, and I think as the dynamics shift, the the arguments in favor of learning your craft better so that you can get staffed on a show will actually sort of rise back up. Right, your point being, and the point that you and Nicole have made is that you need to learn the craft because if you write a pilot without having learned the craft, your pilot is not gonna be that strong. It will not get onto the desks of people who are hiring you and onto the desks of executives. Yeah, writing a pilot is the hardest thing to do in, in our jobs. It's, it's so much harder than, than writing a script on a show, writing a spec of a show, having to like, if you're doing it well, if you're creating a world and launching it with that story and introducing all those characters, and it's all like alone in your room, that is the hardest thing to do. And I think is such a burden to put on young writers with the expectation that this then be their calling card going forward, or worse yet, that they're gonna sell that out of the gate. It's just yeah. an unrealistic expectation and a demand. Great. Yeah, yeah totally. Um, Nicole, go ahead. 
I would add too that like I have seen young writers write an, a really good pilot, like big ideas and execute it really well. And you know, part of the question is right, how long did they spend working on that script? Right? Yeah. You can spend two years, years writing yeah. an amazing pilot, but if you haven't done the hard work of writing full episodes of existing shows, you still don't know how to do the job you're actually trying to get. Right. right. And Jamie, do you want to talk some more about some basic nuts and bolts about writing specs of an existing show? Because, you know, like we're talking, a lot of people start out that way and it's good to know the format, like know the show you're specking, the research and the tone and the theme and how that works, how you see that from your end. Yeah, I mean, for me, I, I, you know, I completely agree with, with everything that Bob and Nicole were saying. It's like for you, you want to know that you're hiring somebody who gets your show who can capture the tone of the show, the voices of the characters, because it just makes your life as a showrunner that much easier. I mean, most you know, showrunners at some point, uh, depending on how much time you have, are gonna be taking a last pass at every episode that comes in. And you know, so you're in some ways, uh, you know, you're having to be uh, you know, the air traffic controller who's trying to land all of those scripts that are gonna make it to production. And you know, um, I think every showrunner has had that challenge of your partway into a season and you, you know, you have maybe the more seasoned writers that you know you can rely on who are writing those first few episodes and you're on track and then you give an, a script to someone who maybe doesn't have um, as, as much experience or hasn't quite captured the voice yet and you find yourself looking at what could be a page one rewrite as you're starting to go into production and it just sort of like it can throw the, everything off. So um, for me, you know, um, I love seeing a great original pilot, but uh, it's really helpful uh, to see, you know, that someone, um, as Bob was saying, can, you can, you're emulating the voice of the show creator um, and you're, um, you're, you're a mimic who can actually capture different voices. You know, when I, when I've, you know, I try to see, you know, a dramatic sample of obviously if it's a drama show, I like to see comedy stuff too. But that, um, that is gold to a showrunner when you have, especially a younger writer who's like totally able to, you know, just hone in on the voice. And you're like, okay, I know I can give them a script and it's not gonna come back and bite me later on. And you're gonna end up going to those writers more often and you're gonna end up being elevated more quickly um, if you're a part of that. Uh, you know, if you're a part of not, uh, not a part of the problem, <laughs> if you're actually <laughs> not creating problems. That's 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 worth its weight in gold. Look at all Great. the nodding we're all doing. You can tell. Them <laughs> I know. Don't and be actually, a part of the problem. This is cool. Yeah. It's a big. Well, and, and honestly, even to like what Bob was saying when it comes to punctuation, I you know, um, I happen to be someone who will be completely driven nuts if there if, if someone decides that you know what I like to use ellipses versus dashes when you know that you've read episodes of yeah. the show. And it's like, well, that, that's not, you know, it, I don't, it's not like you're going to get, you know, most re you know, reasonable people aren't going to, you know, penalize you or fire you for that. But again, you don't want to do stuff that's going to be distracting or irritating. You know, whatever also, you can do, you know, it's also you can do to just deliver the best version of that writer's, you know, uh, style, the, the better served you'll be. Yeah, Sean is not going to fire you for wrong punctuation, but it's gonna, it's, it delivers a message. Like I've yeah. heard showrunners complain about that. It's like this writer's been on the show for two years. Haven't they noticed that, right. yeah, I don't like ellipses or haven't right. they noticed that I put this many spaces after the period? Why do I have to go through the whole script and change that? They, if they're trying, if they're doing their job, they've noticed how I do it by now. Like the, for me, like actually the, the one other show that I was, because I was, um, you know, hired to, to run the writer's room on the flash in the first season and uh, the first thing I did was read the the pilot script, obviously watch the pilot and then read the pilot script. And there was a very, a very specific way of, you know, double dashes. And that was just like, it, it was, I was, I happened to be someone that had used a different style before. And I was just like, nope, I'm going to make sure when, you know, when it's uh, my turn up at bat, um, they're not going to get distracted by that. That's not going to be a problem. Right. Right. And Letitia, can you speak from your point of view, um, just again about uh, writing the spec script and emphasizing how important the research and nailing the tone and the theme, like 
the magicians would do a, a musical episode, but mm -hmm. SWAT probably wouldn't. So, you know, you want to make sure that people know their show. And can you just speak to us a little bit more about that? Well, you know, what's funny is I think I've probably read two existing specs in my life. We don't read those really? at the network. Um, we are definitely more originals, um, you know, because that's how we staff the room and, and whatnot is, is usually based on original specs. Um, so it's so funny because I totally understand everything that they're saying. It's so important to have those things, uh, yeah. you know, for a writer in a room. But, you know, as, as I'm staffing people, I don't read, I just don't read those. I, I wish I had more to say on it, but it's just not something that we read. Well, but that's a really interesting perspective, though, I think, mm -hmm. to know, because you're, you, you are in some ways. That's the reason I, um, like, I don't know, Bob, what you've done, done Nicole, I, I, I tend to ask if someone does have a, a, a spec of a show, especially if it's in the genre or whatever show I'm, I'm working on, I ask for an original and I ask for a spec that's at least in this, you know, the same vein. You, you ask um, for so one of each. I ask for one of each because I want to see, I want to see if they, you know, if they can be a mimic, if they, you know, if they are willing to do the work, um, because it really is work to study analyze, break down how someone writes a story, their, their act structure, their act outs, the voices of the characters, the setups and the payoffs, um, you know, the difference in, in you know, uh, the voices of characters, those subtleties, when you see someone who's really, you know, done that well, and you're like, okay, you're doing that in service of somebody else's voice. I think I, it, it sort of sends me a message that you're gonna do the same thing if I hire you for, for my show. But at the same time, I, I want to know what's your original voice and, you know, what your creativity does. Like Bob said, when you're stuck in a room by yourself, banging your head on a, on a keyboard, um, trying to create a world and characters that are going to resonate with an audience. And so um, I, I really like to see one of each. That's what I, I tend to ask for. Yeah, I always yeah. tell people to have, just have one spec you love at the ready so that if someone says they want to see one you got it right why would you not have every tool available to you that could help you in this sure. impossible effort of trying to get a, a staff job and i wanted to say i just to add i know one of the things that i've heard people say about them now right in the argument of like why why there are so many showrunners who won't read them is well there's so many shows now there's so many shows now yes. it's impossible for someone to have watched everything my advice to people is always Expect something you love. you love. I don't care if it's Agreed. popular. I don't care. I, I broke into the business on a spec of The Closer, which everyone was like, nobody watches that show in the industry. And I was like, I don't care. I love it. And that's how <laughs> I got into the CBS writing program. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I just read a spec by a young writer that I mentor. And it's not a show I particularly enjoy, but her love of the show is so obvious on the page. Mm -hmm. She just nailed everything I know to be true about how this show works. And I was like that, that's your job. You just did it. Yeah. And, and to acknowledge it, although I adamantly disagree with this, there are showrunners who don't want to read specs because they don't think it tells them anything because mm -hmm. they think that, you know, why, why do I need to see that this writer can, you know, mimic another show that somebody else put on television. Um, so there is that point of view too. I'm curious to, to ask Leticia, just back to something you said that, that you don't see them cross your desk. Would you read them if they did? Is it a, is it- a, Of course. Was, oh yeah. yes, if they are submitted to us, I would of course read it. It's not yeah. like we actively tell people not to submit them, but we do, we just don't get them. Mostly- That's just I kind think, of what's coming around, yeah. Well, also I think because when you're staffing a room, I feel like the, um, when you staff a room, you're looking for different voices to put together. It's like a puzzle, right? For us, at least. I'm sure you guys all have perspectives on this. But for us, when we're staffing a room, we want to see, we want to put the puzzle together. You know, is this person good at world building? Is this person funny? Does this person have this? And of course, that can be, you know, relayed in a, in a spec from an existing show. But a lot of the times, it's more relayed by something that's original. That's just you know, yeah. how we're doing it, but I totally understand you guys. I would actually, now I'm like, maybe I want to read some, <laughs> some specs of shows. Well, do you think then, um, would you agree that at the lower level, especially people more likely than not will want to read 
your spec if you're an unproven, unstaffed writer. An EP will probably want an, a spec of a show along with an original sample in many cases because they don't know you. They don't know if you can do that job. Yeah, that's that's my perspective on it, at least. And um, you know, may, maybe it's uh, um, you know a more traditional kind of approach to it. But again, it's like since I don't know you anyway. Um, and you're, you are at the, at the, you know, the entry level, the lower levels, um, you know, that, that is the job is to, you know, yeah. can, can you capture, um, what the voice of a show is, um, that that's just helpful. It just tells me again, um, I know you're well, I know you've got at least the, the mechanics and the chops to do that. And that's what yeah. I really need you to do. And if you help, you know, also happen to have. Um, you know, a brilliant creative mind, or like Leticia said, you know, it's like, I, I look at the, you know, um, building the writer's room, it is, it's like, you've got this, this big puzzle that you're trying to put together, but you don't have what the final picture is. You don't even know what that is until you sort of figure out what all the pieces are that are sent to you. And you're like, okay, these are the pieces I have, what can I make from that? That's going to be cohesive and actually work well together. And, um, you know, it's not just about your, your skills on the page, it's about the ideas that you have in the room, it's about whether you're funny or whether you're some, you know, somebody um, who is fantastic at story structure or someone who's just a big idea person, as well as personalities. Because, you know, when you spend eight hours a day in an enclosed space, as you guys all know, uh, you have to, some people are going to rub each other wrong and egos get involved. And so like, you know, that's like a big thing, you know, at least from my perspective is, you know, we've always had a no douchebag policy, you know, mm -hmm. for any writing staffs that we're putting together. And that- I have that for my life. Yes. Yeah. It's, no it's, really <laughs> it's it, you know, it, it should it's apply very good. across yeah. the board. But, um, it, you know, if you can put together a, a room of people that actually enjoy being there, and who like the show and who do have, you know, all these skill sets. You've got like this giant Swiss army knife of, of tools at your disposal that all work, you know, um, uh, you know, cohesively together. Uh, that's, that's the dream room that you're trying to assemble. Great. And um, one more thought or question about the spec before we go on and open it more to uh, original pilots is Nicole writing the specs, like, it can be frustrating for a writer because it's like, all right, well, I'm writing something that I don't own and that's going to be out of date in like six to nine months. But the point is, is that each time you write a script, you get better, right? Yes. I think that's a hundred percent. It's you are training yourself to be a better writer with every script you write, whether it's a spec or a pilot, whatever project you're working on. And so I, if you write one, you know, Certainly you should invest more time in pilots. That is going to get you the most mileage. But if you, for every, I tell people, for every three pilots you write, write a new spec. So that you just, you're refreshed, you have something that's current. And we all have shows we love. It's not that hard. I wrote a spec yeah. of Castle in a weekend because I needed a light toned dramedy spec and I didn't have one. So I did it because I watched Castle like a crazy person and it was easy to write. <laughs> all right. I do feel like I need to like warn a lot of writers out there though. Nicole is incredibly talented and fast. That is, that's like one of those <laughs> things yeah. that- yeah, I mean, I, I didn't sleep literally for I three mean, days. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I had to write the season, the series finale of Eureka in a weekend. And that was still challenging having already built the world and knowing the characters and the voices and all that stuff. It, it, that, it, that's, right. that's, a, that's a tough, that's a, that's a tall <laughs> order to do. Give yourself two weeks. It's just like to be reasonable. Yeah. Don't don't pick yeah. yourself if you didn't do it in a weekend. Absolutely. I usually but I tell think starting if it's, if it's sorry, right. Spiro, I was gonna say if it's a show you love, it's not gonna it's be easier. this Herculean yeah. task. Yeah. You're just like, and I always wish they told this story, so write it. And I think yeah. that's a great way to think of it too, Nicole. Is that that if, if it's something that you already love and you know the characters and you know the whole show, it's you're gonna be that much better at it. It's gonna come up come across on the page. Yeah, and it's gonna come quicker, like you're saying. Yeah. Um, let's uh, talk more about the original spec. Um, how do those work and what purpose they serve? You know, how are they looked at from the executive side, you know, and as a, just as much as the EP side. And uh, someone talked to me about how important are the first 10 pages? Oh, God. Well, how, how important are the first 10 minutes of a show? <laughs> <laughs> it, it all depends on when you want to, you know, where your turnoff point is. I think it's very important. You know, you set up the show in the first 10 minutes. There's a lot you can do in the first 10 minutes. 
you can set up the show, you can set up the character, even if it's a, you know, the teaser is something completely ridiculous and you has no really bearing on the show. It sets up the tone of the show. So I, th I personally think the first 10 minutes or the first 10 pages are extremely important to, to reel that person in. But I read beyond that, <laughs> obviously, but I feel that they're very important. I, I love that you said obviously, but I want to ask you a question, another question, Letitia. See, I, we're, we're, I'm actually interviewing Letitia. That's my you guys job are all out of panel. But, yeah. That's okay, Bob and I go <laughs> way here's, back. Here's, 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 here's a way of answering how important the first 10 pages are, or it'll get to it. Letitia, how many scripts do you have to read a week? A week? Yeah. I, uh, you know, on a regular, on a regular week. Yeah, I don't if life know. is going normally, yeah. Or during, during pilot season. I, I would say 10, 10 to 20, maybe. Okay, and, and for, for, you know, sometimes you hear a much bigger number than that. Well, um, those but, but are 20, like the 10 to 20 that we get submitted, and then obviously I have all my current shows, and that can be anywhere from, from right. nothing to, to four or five scripts uh, a week. Right. But the plus, point that Bob's getting some, to some dailies and some posts, you know, like this, this, and some meetings, and like. I'm know, not saying very, I read all yeah. scripts from page one until the end. I'm just saying right. I read more than 10 pages. But that also, <laughs> yeah. it, that also though, again, underscores your point of it's really important to hook you really as, as when you know that you've got a stack that's waiting for you. Mm -hmm. um, if you want someone like you who's in a position to actually make or break somebody's, you know, entry into a show. Um, you want to be hooked so that you can you read as much as possible, right? There, there are yeah, there are executives. shows that I start reading. There are specs that I start reading, and I know for a fact we will never do this. But it is so good that I have to read the end. Of, I have to read and to the end. That's the best. That's a good do. compliment for right. a writer. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. That's, that's what you want. Mm -hmm. Like as a writer, you want that. Yeah. You definitely hear execs say, you know, I know by a few pages in whether this writer can write. I know whether I 100%. care. And, and so, and, and they will stop reading if they're not enjoying it by that point, or if they, they don't think that, you know, obviously you hope, as, as Letitia just said, that an exec's eye is primarily on, is this good writing? Is this a good writer? Um, if you're using it as a staffing sample. Uh, but if someone is, you know, tossing that script in the reject pile five pages in, well, then it doesn't matter if you like, had a really big finish. If you paid off it right well, they never got to it. Right. right. Exactly. And Nicole, don't you think that uh, that, again, going back to, you know, writing the scripts and everything, like that's the writer's job. Like your job is to hook them and to keep them reading, right? Absolutely. I mean, that is the task, right? Especially if you work, I mean, I guess in any form of television, right? But certainly in, if you work in broadcast, you better get them hooked, it, you know, before you go to the first commercial break or they're going to go click and turn on a yeah. different show. And unless you're, you know, some obsessive fangirl about the show, like I am about many. So it's like you, your job is to make someone say, I have to come back and see what happens next. Right. And it's, yeah. it's that, you know, in every build through the script, when you get to every act out, it's like, even if you're not putting act outs in your script, you should still be writing like there's act outs. And like, what's the thing that's going to keep people watching and not turn to something else. Right. So um, ask, here's a couple of questions to throw out to the group. So what do you have to do to make your script stand out? And what do you want to see, don't want to see in the script and when you're a reader? My number one don't want to see is I don't want to see a woman described as, she's pretty, but she doesn't know it. She doesn't know it. <laughs> That's, uh, if, but she when doesn't I see that, know it. <laughs> right, I roll my eyes because there, there are better ways to describe women than that. That's, a, yeah. that's, that's really my biggest don't. No cliches. <laughs> Um, great. Um, let's talk also about, this is something that I know Nicole and I have spoken a lot about uh, through being in similar writing programs, is the importance about writing uh, what you know, writing from personal experience and emotional, emo emotional truths, um, and how that works in your original pilot, even in a spec, and what can, that can do for you and your voice. Well, there are kind of two sides to that, that idea of writing what you know. Uh, the one that I think people tend to go to when they, when they hear that phrase, and, and this is very valid, it's, it's certainly important, is if you're writing a script, if you're, you know, if you're writing a spec, uh, I mean a pilot, um, you wanna provide something unique. You wanna write something that only you could write. Um, so if you, have, if you can find something in your own life experience that you're gonna bring to the table that no one else uh, has, you know, can contribute, um, then, then that's fantastic. There's also kind of a broader um, 
point to make about writing what you know. You know, like I've, I've done a lot of writing aliens and, and guys who fly around in capes and um, I'm not one of those, <laughs> but, but I can still write it because the, what I know in that case is authentic emotional experience. I'm finding myself and what I can relate to in these characters. And that's always the foundation of the story. Um, the emotional so, experience. Yeah, so, so that's kind of the way you should think about writing what you know too. Um, you know, if you're, if you're writing a character or a character with an emotional point of view that you have no foothold into, that you've just never experienced anything like that, maybe it's not what you should be writing, or maybe you should figure yeah. out what your emotional connection to that character is, because that's what you've got to convey to the reader. Yeah, and I think along those lines, right, it's something I t I've told some of the writers I mentor is, it's what's the thing that interested you about this in the first place? Like, make me feel what yeah. mattered to you about this area, whether you've lived through it or not. You read an article and something caught your attention. Make me feel that. Make me understand why this made you stop and say, I have to talk about it. Yeah, that's a great, great point. Especially important when you get into the meetings too. Like I, yeah. the, uh, the uh, I, I saw the pilot this last cycle to ABC, and and it started off a very academic, you know, nonfiction psych psychology book that I had read uh, about an area that really interested me. And you know, whatever, ninety nine percent of that wasn't in the pilot. It was just sort of the birth of the character, but it made for a very passionate pitch meeting and made for great conversations with the executives. Um, so it, that, that expands beyond the page. Hey, Bob, I'm curious, did you, um, did you pitch it first or did you write, did you spec pilot? No, I pitched it. Okay. Yeah. Um, we are, just got time for a couple more questions. I didn't realize this would go by so fast online. It seems like Always it would uh, feel longer, but it goes by fast. Um, yeah. So, all right, let's uh, talk about uh, fighting the odds and getting into writing programs and getting staff, like you just don't walk in and do that, right? <laughs> I mean, I know very few people who have just walked in and done that. Yeah, yeah so yeah. I, I will admit, I have to, that I got, I got very, very lucky. Um, and the, uh, and Leticia, I think you were there from the very beginning of Eureka. I was. Um, I was, uh, you know, I had started off, you know, working in feature film publicity, decided to start writing feature film scripts, got, you know, sold, uh, you know, a spec, and then a couple more specs, but, you know, wasn't getting them into production. You know, you, you, you would get into that. I'm sure a lot of you can relate, you know, you, you have all the attachments and the actors and the director and everybody says it's a go, and then one element falls out and the whole house of cards comes down. Yep. So we happened to um, uh, pitch the idea for Eureka um, to Sci-Fi Channel to Mark Stern shortly after he had took it, taken over the network. And it was, so I think, the right idea sort of at the right time with the right executive in the network. And I went from being, uh, you know, a feature writer to a TV, you know, writer, executive producer, you know, without having ever been in a writer's room. And, you know, and, and so for me, I was relying on, I, I was like a sponge. I wanted to um, absorb all of the talents and the skill sets and the experience, um, experiences of everybody else who had been going through that process from writer's assistant up the ladder. And, um, you know, you get tossed into the deep end, it's sink or swim. And luckily, you know, we figured out how to swim, but, um, <laughs> that, <laughs> but um, it was, uh, um, you know, uh, for me, I, you know, I, I am, you know, incredibly grateful to the, the writing staffs that, you know, you're in charge of hiring and staffing in, in, in those, those first seasons who, you know, you know, you're like, I get that you have all this experience and I'm, you know, uh, I'm going to do the best that I can to uh, learn from it and then apply it and then be at, at a point where, um, you know, you know what you're doing. Right. The, um, the thing about the, the, it being tough odds, I mean, the, the answer is kind of in the question, the odds are really, really tough. Yeah. And uh, Sam, Sam Simon, the, the creator of uh, The Simpsons, said that success in Hollywood is a combination of five things in this order. Dumb luck, hard work, 
tenacity, who you know, and then maybe talent. Hmm. And, yeah. and I think it's a really accurate list that, yeah. you know, it, it, it really, it's first and foremost, it's, it's just luck. Um, but, but you do make your own luck with, you know, preparation with, and with the hard Yes, the, with, with the other things, with the hard work and the tenacity. Yeah. And you really yeah. just kind of have to throw everything you can at the wall. You have to be out there applying for all those assistant jobs and, and you know, script uh, writer's PA jobs and applying to all the programs. Like, you know, you've even heard uh, Nicole came through and, and Spiro and you did. And, and it's, it's you, you got to try everything because there's a lot of people and, you know, it's a very small game of musical chairs with a lot of people trying to sit in those chairs. So leave so. no stone unturned. Yeah. yeah. And, and, um, stick, guys, and stick with it. Yeah. Um, as we wrap up, um, let's talk for a minute about the day to day of being a writer, like starting off writing in a vacuum and trying to stay engaged and fighting doubt, especially in this age of shut in. Um, any type of advice, ideas of how you got started, things that keep you motivated or where you go to find that inspiration? You know, it's funny, I was, um, I was deep in my pilot process. I had a very difficult uh, outline <laughs> process with this pilot. And um, I, was, I was having one of those like, oh my God, this project's gonna kill me, whatever. Right about the time mm -hmm. that Glenn Mazzara tweeted about his, um, his experience with and uh, now I can't the dark tower and the dark okay. tower getting passed on and all the work he had done and all that stuff going into it and it was I was so heartened by having someone like him share that and just a reminder that like it's always hard this is always, it's always hard. hard it's hard <laughs> when you're starting out it's hard when you're Glenn Mazzara it's like it's always going to be hard and yeah. so you get through the hard days and then you're like oh look at what I wrote that was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I remember Mark Gordon on a panel once. Um, he was talking, you know, and I can't even remember how many hundreds of hours of television he had produced at that point. And he was just like, listen, even me at this point, having, a, you know, a breadth of experience and a track record, if I sell one out of 10 pitches in a season, that's pretty good, you know, odds, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, you know, it, that that is the reality you know what even though that there are so many extra platforms now and streamers and markets um, to be able to go to there's still that much more content and people that are buying to get in those spots so uh, the, it's like the just, odds are not in your favor but no. if it's what you want to do and if it's you're driven to do it then you have to keep doing it yeah 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 i think um, there i've told this story before but like right before um things really started to happen for me i had this like moment where I thought, well, maybe, maybe this isn't my thing. Maybe I've been wrong about this writing thing and it's not going to be my, my journey. But I realized I would still write even if nobody ever paid me for it. So it's like, sometimes you just have to go back to that place, right? Like, even if no one ever paid me again to write a page, I would still write. So why not try to get paid for it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and just put up with the rejection that comes along with it. And, and you also, just, Spiro, you, you asked not just about the, like, the rejection part of it, but also just the, the hard work of the, um, you know, like, the, the quiet days. And, and for sure, like, there's, there are days when I will sit on this, this very sofa and stare at the ceiling all day and not get a lot of words on paper. And, but after a couple of those, maybe then the words start flowing. And it's you just have to stick with it. You have to put in the hours, even if it feels on some days like there wasn't a lot produced in those hours, you're still doing the work. You're still thinking, you're still figuring it out. And it is hard work. So don't beat yourself up about it being hard. And I don't, uh, nice. I don't know about you guys, but um, you know, to your point about also being isolated right now, I, I kind of have to make myself have a schedule as if I was going into a writer's room and I have, mm -hmm. um, you know, all of these deadlines to me. I have, I try to say, okay, I'm going to have, you know, um, you know, I know I'm going to get up at a certain time. If I'm going to, you know, exercise, do that, do the chores, do the bills or whatever. And then I'm going to sit and have a concentrated period um, until lunch. And that's when, you know, whether I'm outlining and I want to get through, you know, a, an act of, of story beats um, or whether I'm trying to get to a certain ideal number of pages that I just want to like get written in a day. Um, it's, it, it's, or like Bob said, 
I know I'm gonna to use today to sit in my chair and, and, and just stare at the wall and the ceiling yeah. and really think hard about it until I break through that point where I know I can start to you know, deliver on the page. Um, I, if, I don't have, if I don't have a schedule or, or you know, some kind of roadmap, I can definitely get spun off into those eddies and be stuck there for, for hours or days on yeah. end. Keeping a routine is important. Don't, don't go down yeah. a YouTube hole, you know, researching stuff yes. that is not important to you. Even for me, it's like, you know, it is like, okay, I'm going to turn off my phone and I'm going to close my internet browser so that I'm not even tempted or if I turn off my alerts. So every time, you know, the, the Cheeto in chief, you know, does something ridiculous and it pops up, I'm not attempt, you know, tempted to click on it and, you know, yeah. see what other dumpster fire has been set. Yeah, nowadays, exactly. not paying attention to the news sometimes is the only way to get the it. The only right way. Yeah. yeah. And by the way, if you do go down the YouTube rabbit hole, like, just be kind to yourself afterwards and be like, okay, mm -hmm. so I today that. was that day. That's, I did that's that day. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But sometimes you need that day. Like, sometimes yeah. your brain just yeah. needs to think it's completely disconnected from your work. Typically, yeah. it's not completely disconnected. And, like, somewhere along the YouTube rabbit hole, you're like, oh, that might be something, right? Yeah. And then you... Yeah. Yeah. Right you don't down. know where the idea will come from. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I think we need to wrap up because they're trying to push us out of the room to make room for the next uh, panel right now. <laughs> Mar Marvel has a new movie to premiere in this room. So, got, yeah. um, so we're out of time, but I just really wanted to thank you guys again for being part of this. It was great to see you. Um, this will stream on the Comic-Con YouTube channel in July um, and for the rest of eternity. So um, <laughs> you all, thank you very much for doing this and take care and we'll see you next year at Comic-Con.